It's been nearly two weeks since the NHS opened the doors of its first Nightingale Hospital uh, for coronavirus. And here at This Morning, we've been doing our little bit to support them. Yes, well, we asked you um, to get your children to draw some lovely or paint some pictures to decorate the wall. And this is an area where the staff go um, in between their shifts to, you know, re rest, relax. But have we thought the, Have a cup of tea. We thought the, the walls look very bare. So your children, have, you've been sending in thousands of their pictures and paintings. We sent them to the hospital at the XL uh, Centre in London, as Eamon said, and you can see there, they've all been put up on the walls. Well, what we want to do now is to cross there and speak to the centre's chief nurse, Eamon Sullivan, uh, with the, uh, the art there, Eamon. The art's all behind you there on, on Good Looks Well. Good, good morning, uh, Eamon Ruth. Yeah, and, and thank you very much for, for organising this. It, it means so much to us and it really has brightened up what was a very great conference centre and, and, and made it really personal and, and it's really important for our staff, so thank you. Eamon, let me ask you, um, uh, you know, what you're doing there clinically. Um, you, you have the capacity to treat thousands of people. So far as I understand, you're doing great work, but the numbers are much smaller than people thought, which I presume is a good thing. It, it is, Eamon. It's, it's a really good thing. It means that London is, is, is holding its own. Uh, we're, we're here for London. We're the, we're the pressure valve. We're the pop-up valve when London needs us. So we're very pleased that we're not at 500, 1,000, 2,000. That's, that's, that's really, really good news. I mean, you're, um, you're a chief nurse normally, Eamon, in um, the ICU unit at the Royal Marsden. So how did you get involved with Nightingale? How much involvement did you have setting the hospital up? Well, uh, yeah, uh, Ruth, I, I, I had a call a couple of weeks ago saying, could I attend a meeting at 7 a.m. in Great Ormond Street? And uh, I did with a group of other uh, doctors and other managers and other colleagues. None of us who had, had met each other, very few of us had met each other. Uh, and then probably I kind of went home three weeks later. So um, working with our military colleagues and NHS colleagues, we pretty much designed and built the hospital in very short order, as, as, as was the mission that was given to us. Um, so, it, you know, it's been a tremendous effort by many, many thousands of people from the military, from the NHS, from the contractors. It's, it's, it's something, you know, it's, I, I'm in awe of, of, of the work that's been done by people. It's truly humbling. So you're standing by, you're ready. The people who you would have there at the moment, give us a rough indication of uh, what happens, how you would end up there at the XL. Yes, so, so, so we are the, the, the same as any of the critical care units in London. Uh, we're treating all COVID positive patients. Uh, and, you know, we're at, at the moment, we're, we're the size of a teaching hospital in terms of the number of patients, but is we, we offer the full modality of intensive care. We're an intensive care unit. Um, so we offer organ support for, for, for the lungs, for the heart and for the kidneys, the same as any of the intensive care units in London. Well, obviously, uh, you know, it's very busy, long shifts, we know. Um, how important is it, your rest area for the, the staff there and, and those paintings adorning the wall, how much difference will this make to, to when you're having your breaks? This is a sanctuary. It's, it's a quiet place for our staff to go to. It's used a lot. And I see people sitting here looking at the walls, contemplating, reflecting, uh, in, in moments of calm. It really is a very special place for us. It means so much to us, these pictures. It shows that we're not alone, that we're loved. It's palpable, the love that's oozing from those pictures. In, indeed, my own children have, have produced pictures, and, and I think it's important for children at this time because it's a confusing time, so they can practically help us, and, and they really are helping us by producing these pictures and putting them on Instagram and putting them on Twitter and sending them into us. Well, so we're, you... glad that we're glad they're helping, Eamon, and um, good luck to you and all your staff, yeah. and thank you so much for all the amazing work that you're doing. Absolutely brilliant, mate, and, and lovely to talk to another Eamon with two N's. <laughs> I mean, they think, you see, they think in, in this country they don't even know this name, and therefore, like, every second person <laughs> in Ireland is a Eamon. There, there we go. <laughs> good man. Thank you, Eamon. God bless you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, no, Bye, earlier... Yeah. Thank you, Eamon. Uh, earlier in the week, we were talking to Dr Larissa and uh, she volunteered to be seconded to a frontline uh, ICU union, unit in another hospital in London. Um, we're joining her there again. Uh, Larissa, last time we saw you, you were quite exhausted. Um, you'd had some long days. Have you managed to have some time off? And how important is that time off? <laughs> It's really important and it's something we're all making an effort to do. So each morning when we come in, um, we sort of see how um, one another is doing and whether anyone needs a little bit of time off to rest, if anyone's feeling exhausted and we've got enough staff cover 
we just allow that time for people to go home and recuperate. And also it's quite important in terms of just reducing our viral exposure and load in order to just try and make sure we stay as fit and healthy as possible. But I'm pleased to say that since I last spoke to you, there's been a real turnaround in terms of some cases that we're seeing. I'm, I'm wearing my special hat today, which is always a good sign <laughs> because it means things have been amazing in a sense. We've really seen several patients turn a massive corner. And if you remember last time I spoke to you about a patient whose hand I kept squeezing when he was unconscious and on a ventilator. So he was my very first patient that I met in the intensive care unit when I first started. And just to give you a little bit of context as to how he came in, when he arrived about three weeks ago to the hospital, he really was at death's door. He couldn't breathe. Um, he was incredibly unwell and, you know, he's in his 70s, he's got another lung condition, ex-smoker, so many factors against him and really his chances of survival were minuscule. One of my brilliant colleagues here managed to intubate him and he had the best possible care and support. So um, I grew very attached to him and I visited him each day, even when I moved to a different part of the intensive care unit. And then just two days ago, in fact, after I finished chatting with you, we had a call to our ward to say that he was being admitted. And he came up, he was alert, he was chatting in bed. I wasn't sure whether he'd recognize me, but he did. And he had this huge grin on his face. And I just went up to him and we hugged and we mm -hmm. hugged, obviously my protective gear, I hasten <laughs> to add. Um, and it was just a really, really special moment. I, I can't yeah. even put it into words and, and you to must know be, that he's now going to make it. Just briefly, you must be learning more about this actual virus and how it works and who it strikes and the effects yeah. that it has. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting, actually, Eamon, because what we're seeing is that, that the predominant number of people that it affects we've seen is the older age group, so over 65, and those with other conditions, whether they be lung conditions, heart conditions, kidney conditions, and, and so on, they seem to fare much worse. Um, however, it's not to say that young patients are not affected. And in fact, one of our youngest patients is only 28 years old. So it, it, it definitely, it, it is a broad cross-section of people that it's affecting. But really interestingly, in terms of what we're seeing in the intensive care unit, if you're poorly enough to end up here, you have yeah. really less than a 50% chance of survival. And the things that people seem to be dying from, aside from problems with breathing and sepsis, is actually to do with blood clotting um, disorders. So it seems that this virus seems to be having an effect on making people more predisposed to having clots in their lungs, their legs, a stroke and so on and that's really the big killer here and and what you know we, we are doing a lot of research into at the moment well you keep on doing what you're doing thank you very much you, for, that, for that analysis and that interpretation of what's going on there so it targets um blood vessels uh, and and as larissa was saying there um more patients than you would have thought are dying from strokes and blood clots not just pneumonia or something like sepsis but keeping it at bay what about keeping all of this at bay so we're going to cross to Dr Chris hasn't been on our screens for a little while but is back today um, to give us his take on on coronavirus and Chris you were saying immunity all important uh, absolutely and um, uh, what, what I'd uh, like to stress is how to, to boost your um, immune system because your immune system protects you against viruses and bacteria. Uh, the, the, the interesting thing is 70% of the body's total immune system is actually in your gut, and that's quite remarkable. And what we're talking about here are your friendly bacteria. So what I want to advise you to do is to increase the, um, uh, the population of friendly bacteria by eating yogurt, plain Greek yogurt, Greek style yogurt. Um, and if you look at the label uh, on your yogurt, yogurt containers, you might see some long names. These are the names of the, um, the, the bacteria that are in there. Lactobacillus is a common one. Now, having uh, increased the population of those friendly bacteria, you then should feed them by uh, taking probiotics which are found in foods such as beans, any sort of beans, tinned baked beans, fresh beans, French beans, butter beans, etc., and or bananas. They're good, simple, cheap ways of boosting um, yeah, the, the food 
to, to your army of friendly bacteria. And the third point I want to finish with is vitamin D, the sunshine vitamin that's actually made uh, in your skin under the action of sunshine. And of course, the northern hemisphere of the of the world of the, of the world has actually gone through its winter months. So we're all low on vitamin D, and we should be taking vitamin D. What I'd like to do, there's been some papers published on this. I want to read a conclusion of one paper regarding vitamin D. Um, you know, vitamin D deficiency is common. We recommend that those at risk of coronavirus, that is all of us, right, be urgently supplemented with vitamin D to enhance their resistance to COVID-19 and that this advice be quickly extended to the general adult public. Yeah. Very strong recommendation. And you buy, when you're buying your vitamin D, um, you've had this other account there, pharmacy, health food shop, look for vitamin D3 on mm -hmm. the label. Because, Chris, I'll tell you, most people will have a surprisingly low level of vitamin D mm. because we, we spend our time indoors, in offices, in houses, in cars, in buses, trains, whatever, just not getting 15, 20 minutes of sunshine a day. That's right. I take vitamin D3 uh, every day and uh, with recommendations that it helps to boost the immune system, especially with regard to COVID-19 and other viruses. Yeah. Uh, it, 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 it's, it, it's great. So th this simple three-point plan is yoghurt, beans and or bananas. I mean, right. obviously, Chris, these things aren't going to prevent you getting it, but, you know, it's good to boost your immune system anyway. Um, just to say, 40 years um, you've been in medicine. What do you Think make of this virus? Have you never known anything like it? And there's so much of it still we no. don't know. None of us have. No, no, no doctor alive has seen anything like this. The last pandemic was 1917 to 18, which was Spanish flu that killed millions uh, uh, around the globe. But this is just, and of course, it's a new one. Uh, yeah, uh, a lot of research is going on, but we don't know uh, an awful lot about it. We're learning every day about this virus. And, you know, we've certainly... Um, Self-isolation and social distancing is helping, um, but you know we, we haven't got uh, any treatment that's been proven to work yet. The vaccine could be many, many months away. So I'd advise our viewers look, follow this three-point plan of yogurt, right, beans and bananas, and vitamin D. Okay, three. my Look friend. Thank Chris, you, Chris. Thank you. Really good to see you. Lovely Look seeing you, yourself. mate. Keep well. Thanks a lot. God bless you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.